Hey everyone, welcome and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I will be showing you how I sketch and paint a little cafe in Penang with ink and watercolor. For this sketch, I will be using a mechanical pencil to do a very simple pencil sketch first before drawing the pen outlines with a fountain pen, followed by watercolor. Remember to use waterproof ink when working with watercolor, so it doesn't matter what pen you use, as long as it's waterproof, it will be fine. So this reference photo was taken by me in Penang, and it's a very simple little cafe but with some interesting details. I also love the tree on the left, so I will definitely include that. However, I might leave out the buildings at the back since there isn't a lot of space on my sketchbook page to include everything. So my own reference photo was taken around late morning and the shadows didn't look so interesting to me. So I looked up other reference photos and found one on their FB page where they had this photo with in my opinion, more interesting shadows. And you can see the more defined shapes of each shadow, like the tree shadow on the wall and the cupboard and the floor. And also for that bench and the, that um, plant in the front. So I will mainly be using the first reference, but the shadows will be based on the second photo. I always spend some time visualizing the subject on paper before I draw anything. Like, I use my fingers or a pen or a pencil to estimate where things will go on the page. And that helps me to visualize things. For example, um, should I draw the building in the center or slightly shift it to the right or the left? And where will the tree be? And in this case, I think it should be on the left um, third of that page. So right now I am dotting in where I estimate the four corners of the building to be. Um, it's a, these, this sketch is composed of very simple shapes and we just need them in the right position and size. So now we have those dots on the page, we can sort of see where the building um, will be and how big it will appear on the page. And at this point, I felt like I needed to move the building slightly higher up. So I made a few more dots which are higher and rubbed off the older marks which were lower down. Now I am connecting those dots using light strokes with the pencil. Here I'm adding the bench and also that small tree in the pot. I think it's a fiddle leaf fig tree and do correct me if I'm wrong. 
and after that i'm just going to add the door and the window on that building and that's it it's a simple pencil sketch just to have a base to build upon so we don't need to be really too detailed with the pencil sketch All right, that's it for the pencil sketch. And now I'm going to start inking. So this is my usual Lamy Safari pen. And inside this pen, I have black Noodler's ink, which is water resistant. And I get lots of questions about this and I kind of wonder why, but um, according to the manufacturer, this ink is only supposed to be water resistant on cellulose paper cellulose paper but i have used it on a hundred percent cotton paper and it was water resistant as well so i can't say how it will work on all paper and not all paper is as bleed proof but always test the ink first before doing a sketch um, sometimes it's it takes longer for the ink to fix to really dry on the paper and it also depends a lot on the humidity in your environment so to be safe i i always wait at least around 15 minutes after i finished um, sketching everything before using watercolor over these ink lines especially if I haven't used this particular paper before or I'm not familiar with the ink of course if using ink and a fountain pen sounds like too much work for you feel free to use a waterproof fine liner or any pen to do your sketching when sketching a simple subject i think it really makes you realize how much each pen stroke is so important and i find that over the years i have moved away from rigid straight lines and started to prefer more organic lines um, sometimes you, people call them crooked lines or broken up lines and or lines that are different widths and i think that variation gives more character to the piece and it provides more opportunity for you to infuse energy and life into your subjects. So that's why I like making my sketches sort of looser sometimes and sort of playing with bolder and more expressive strokes and not necessarily following what's in the reference. However, today I'm going to be a little bit more um, conservative I'm not going to sketch too loose so I'm going to try following the reference a little bit more today
As you can see, I am slowly building on that pencil sketch and really inking is not that hard when you know where everything should go. So then you can focus on having some line variation in your sketch. For this fig tree, rather than try to sketch every single leaf on that tree, I'm using a continuous line to sketch the rough outline and then the overall shape of the tree is created and then I add a few additional strokes to indicate leaves. So we might call this a loose impression of that tree. So for this sketch, I'm really taking my time. I'm not rushing at all. And this is not a sketch challenge and I'm not trying to complete it within a certain time frame. And something you might not have noticed is that I constantly um, take these little pauses 
after I've sketched something. Like, okay, I finished that um, part and now I'm, I'm taking a small pause and I'm during that pause, I'm looking at the overall picture and how everything is coming together. I'm also um, deciding on the next step, what I should be doing next and how that will contribute to the, the overall picture. And I do sometimes think a lot during those pauses and I do that also when I'm painting as well. Um, and trying to decide how the colors are coming together and what color I should be using next. So I think that's pretty important, um, which is keeping the big picture in mind as you progress through your um, sketch and through your piece. Here I'm adding in the little details in the window and I, th I find that to be very important for this piece in particular, especially since we have quite a plain and simple building. The little details are what will make it interesting.
Right now, I am drawing that chimney, or I guess it's just a shoot for smoke to come out. And I am going to exaggerate that a little bit, make it look a little bit wobbly, just because I think it looks more interesting that way. Your sketchbook is supposed to be your safe space to try new things and to experiment. A place to have fun, to find new ideas and maybe gain some inspiration. Now we won't be able to fit that whole tree in t on that page because it is way too tall. So we are going to have to sketch only half of it. And a very kind urban sketcher shared before that um, it's easier to draw a tree from the top down because the higher the branches are, the thinner they become. So if you start from the top, you just have to draw progressively bigger or wider branches or trunks as you go downwards, which is easier than trying to draw smaller and smaller branches as you go up. So you can always go wider with your branches, but there is definitely a limit to how narrow you can draw them. That is, of course, only one way of doing things. So if you have any tips on drawing trees, I would love to hear them down in the comments below so everyone can um, learn from each other. Now I'm adding the two potted plants at the foot of that tree and some texture to the trunk as well. And after that, I will add in the leaves. And these leaves are in bunches. They are very different from the um, ficus fig tree. Alright, so I initially planned to draw only the cafe and the tree and to leave out the other buildings, but now it seems that the page is a little bit empty on the right side and I think it lacks some perspective. It is a row of buildings and it is not just one single building, so I'm going to try to sketch um, some of those things in 
And but first, let's add the cupboard. I overlooked that detail at first, and now I think it's a great addition to the scene. So let's try to squeeze it in at the corner. And I know there are some unwanted ink lines on um, that I have already put in. So I will try to disguise that with some maybe some texture marks. These little marks really add that little extra something. And it's really tempting for me to go all out on them sometimes, especially for things like adding lots of grass and lots of um, texture on like the uh, plants. But I try to limit myself to adding more later once I have the big picture completed. So this prevents me from going overboard. Right now I'm sketching a bit of the shop on the left just to show that it is a row of shops. And then we have come to a more challenging part right here with this shed-like storage uh, space. So adding this portion will definitely add some interest. So I think it will also add some contrast and a little bit more perspective. As you can see, I drew two lines with the back one um, shorter than the one on the right side and you can see that I am connecting the lines not with a straight line but with these little um, wood columns which are running uh, horizontally across.
Now, after sketching the roof, I am now um, drawing in these wood columns, and you don't need to be too defined with these, just add some lines going right across. They can be broken up lines, and they don't need to be too defined. Now this following line is a little bit tricky and you can see me practicing the movement with my pen first. So I would say that this line is about a 45 degree slant. Next, we have that line in the middle, which is slightly above eye level. So it's slanting downwards towards the center. Right here, I am sketching in those condenser units very loosely. And besides that, I will also be adding some rods and poles there. These elements are not part of the main focus, so I will be adding less detail.
Moving on to the name on the sign. So I'm going to just write taste on there instead of after taste. Why? Well, just because I just like that sound of taste as a name for a cafe. I might add the word after later if I change my mind though. So I wrote the word in pencil first to be safe. And then after that, I'm going to rub off all those pencil marks that we have here, but I don't rub over the words immediately in case the ink hasn't dried yet. So you don't want to smudge the ink before it's dry. So do let it dry for a little bit first to be safe. Now I usually leave the ink to dry for at least 10 to 15 minutes. And in the meantime, I take a break or I plan out the colors. As I pointed out before, I love that the shadows are more defined here. And also below the roof, you can see a more a darker shadow. And you can see where the shadow ends there below. Yeah right there so you can see that the floor is very bright in contrast which is much more interesting than everything in one solid shadow and sometimes i do like to alter the shadows to my liking and just play with different shapes and strokes and not following the reference completely i do that mainly in my sketchbook because, well, your sketchbook is your playground, it is the best place to experiment. But today I'm going to try and follow that reference more closely. So these are some synthetic brushes that I use. Mostly I use the ones in blue for little sketches like this. Today I'm going to be using mostly Daniel Smith's Watercolor Essentials set. I made these pans myself with the tube colors because um, but because I need uh, some browns I'm going to be using burnt sienna, burnt umber and yellow ochre from my Winsor & Newton Cotman box. So you will get to see how these two paints kind of mix together a little bit. So one is student grade paint and one is professional grade paint. Well. Usually I don't mix them if I'm doing like a, a big painting or something that people have commissioned me for. But this is my sketchbook and my sketchbook is my playground. So I play around and experiment with things. So the, for the first color, it is a mix of phthalo blue, Hansa yellow light and French ultramarine. So this first color will be that green-blue color that we want for the door. And sometimes if you don't get it right the first time, you need to keep adding paints just to get the right ratio. And for this particular color, I did struggle with it for a little while. So you can see me mixing for quite some time. And then I um, tested it out on paper and I adjusted it again. So really, the painting process can get much, much longer just because of mixing um, new paints and experimenting. Well, it does take some time to get used to new paints, but it is well worth the effort. And actually, it's kind of fun for me. I did do a few color mixing experiments beforehand, just trying to familiarize myself with this newer set. Now we're going to paint that door and the frame for the window. So this is the main color for this cafe, actually. Most of it is just white. 
And I like to start with a lighter first layer, and then I add another layer to darken the areas that are in shadow. Next, I'm going to mix some new gamboge into a bit of that blue-green mix. So we have a lighter green, and I'm going to use that paint to paint the first layer of that fiddle fig tree. For the second layer, I added more French ultramarine, phthalo blue, and new gamboge for a darker, slightly bluish green. And I painted that second layer more towards the lower left side.
Now I'm going to paint that red bench a mixture of pyro scarlet plus a little touch of quinacridone rose. And in the reference, we don't have a perfectly painted chair. Some of the paint has chipped off or faded, so I'm going to leave some white space at the top of that rectangle, just like paint has chipped off. And for the other more faded out parts of that bench, I dipped my brush in water to dilute the paint first, so we have a more faded and translucent red. And whilst we have that red on the brush, I'm going to paint some of the cups there. Next, I'm going to use pure phthalo blue to paint the pots and some cups. Here I'm mixing new gamboge, which is a sort of light orange color, with a bit of that green mix, so we get a more yellowish green. So I'm using that to paint the taller tree. So I'm taking care to use a green that looks quite different from the one that I used before for the other plants.
Here I'm mixing in some thalo blue and this blue is very strong so I'm really taking care and trying to add only very small amounts to that mix and after that I'm dabbing that darker green that we have into the still wet lighter green paint. Here I'm mixing some burnt sienna and burnt umber for the roof. So I'm going to make it look a little bit patchy and some parts will be darker, some parts lighter. So I vary the darkness of that brown, either by adding a little bit of burnt umber or I add some ultramarine. And if I want to make it lighter, I do add some water. I dip my brush in water and wash off some paint.
Now I'm painting the tree trunk with some brown, the same browns, but I uh, am using a little bit more ultramarine to make it look a little grayer. Now I'm using burnt sienna for the pots and I also add some dabs of burnt sienna here and there on the whole sketch. Here I'm using yellow ochre for that cupboard and I'm making sure that the left side is darker than the right side of that cupboard which has um, more sunlight shining on it. So right now I'm mixing French ultramarine with some burnt sienna and I'm looking for a dark gray color. So I'm going to be painting all the grays starting from now and I'm going first thing I'm going to be painting is that shoot and also the espresso machine and um, using that same color I'm going to start adding shadows. As you can see, I am spreading that wet paint on the paper with a different wet brush that has no paint on it to create a sort of gradient.
Now I'm going to be painting the glass on the door and we already have this dark grey ready but in the picture you can see the reflection of grass on the lower third of that door so I'm preparing some light green on another brush So after painting that green with that small brush, I quickly come in with that dark gray color and paint the top part. So I want those two different paints to mix together a little bit, just a little bit, not too much. So I don't want to like completely cover that green color with the very dark gray. So since the green paint was a little bit dry, it didn't mix as well. So I'm adding a second layer to that green and sort of blending the, those paints together a little bit more. The gray paint is still very wet, so we can still add more paint like so to darken the top part of that um, door and um, to create more shadows. Just a few dabs of red and yellow in there to add some interest and this could be reflections of things in the glass. Here I added a bit of yellow on the top right of that window, which will be a big reflection here, followed by phthalo blue and then grey. And I love how the paints just mix on the page like that. It is um, a little bit difficult to find the right consistency for all of the paints so that they mix in the, the exact way that you want but sometimes you get some little surprises and that's okay as well so that is also um, one of the features of watercolor it's that you can't really um, control it a hundred percent but you do get these little surprises and you do get some very interesting effects And here I'm just continuing to add more shadows.
All right, so at this point, I have added a lot of gray to this piece, and I decided that I would add some dashes of yellow ochre because right now I think it looks a little bit moody, like a sort of downcast day instead of a bright sunny day. So I thought, okay, so this needs a little bit of warmth. Maybe we can add a little bit of yellow in there. So let's try adding some texture and a more bright green to brighten things up a little bit. So now my brush is loaded with green paint and I dabbed off the excess water using a cloth and it's quite, so my brush is quite dry. So I'm just dabbing paint onto the paper like so. And you can see that the texture that we create looks something like tufts of grass. So right now the grass looks a little bit patchy, so I'll fill in those empty spaces a little bit more. As you can see, I'm adding the shadow for the tree and I'm also going to be adding more shadows to more areas. Finally, we are going to paint the shed and here I'm using some French ultramarine followed by burnt sienna, making sure that the paint is really wet so that these two paints will blend together.
Next, I will be painting this whole area with the same colors, which are burnt sienna and burnt sienna mixed with French ultramarine. Most of this area will be in shadow with very little details. So people's focus won't be on this area right here and rather it will be on our main cafe instead.
Alright, so after adding all those finishing touches, I was quite happy with this, but after observing it for a while from afar, I did feel like we needed more red in other areas to sort of offset that red bench. And the shadows were not quite dark enough on the right, so I went back in the next day to retouch this. All in all, I did spend quite a lot of time, quite more time than I was planning to spend on this sketch actually. And I did initially only plan on sketching a simple cafe, a simple building, but somehow it did turn out um, into quite a detailed sketch, at least in my opinion. But I did have a lot of fun and I learned quite a lot. I experimented with things that I don't usually do and um, I used color mixes that I rarely use. So you do learn a little bit with every sketch.
So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, do remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Hopefully you did find something that can help you on your sketchbook journey or you found some inspiration and I hope we can continue to inspire each other. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.